All right, all right, all right. Enough about hurricanes. Let's get into our hurricane of knowledge. Ooh. Whirlwind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rock you like a hurricane, like a, a scorpions. Oh, not happening. Okay. Anywho, so let's continue on with our talk of antibiotics. Uh, we have covered uh, a lot of beta lactam drugs. We covered the carbapenems, the uh, penicillin, cephalosporins, we talked about all the uh, things we, we think about when initiating antibiotics in terms of, you know, the pharmacokinetics, the dynamics of them, etc. Um, what questions do you have so far? Any at all? Nothing. Uh, everyone feels like a really good expert on this stuff. If I tested you the day we come back from a hurricane, you'd be good to go, right? Exactly. Okay. Well, let's see if we have any questions as we move forward. Um, next up, we have vancomycin here. I like to put the structures of some of these just to illustrate some points, like the beta-lactam ring and things like that. What do you kind of notice about vancomycin? It's kind of big. It's kind of bulky, right? What do you think it means in terms of like tissue penetration? It's kind of tough, right? Actually. What's interesting is, is that a lot of times when we're dosing vancomycin, we're going to see that we are trying to account for the fact that it's so big and bulky, and it's really hard for it to um, get into certain tissues, as we're going to see here in just a little bit. Vancomycin, though, it's a really handy workhorse sort of antibiotic. You're going to have a lot of patients you're going to start on vancomycin, especially if you're working in the hospital sort of setting here. What's interesting is that it works on the cell wall, and it works to prevent the, those cross linkages from being made. But what you find is, is it doesn't interact with that penicillin binding protein the same way that the beta-lactam drugs did. Uh, instead, what it's going to do is actually bind to those two D-alanines. If you remember that the beta-lactams kind of look like those two D-alanines to interrupt that penicillin binding protein. This just binds to it directly. And when it binds it up, they can't form that cross linkage. And then when there's no cross linkage, what happens to that cell wall? kind of disintegrates, opens up, you lice out the contents of the cell, no more bacteria, essentially, okay? So again, this is a very good antibiotic because even if you have uh, things that are resistant to the penicillin, say, for instance, or say cephalosporins, vancomycin may still work because it's going through that different mechanism, right? Beta-lactamases, do you think it has any effect on vancomycin? No, because there's no beta-lactam ring on vancomycin. It works through a different mechanism, right? So these are things you want to think about. Um, the thing with vancomycin is it is good for gram-positive coverage only. If I ask you, say you have Pseudomonas aeruginosa, can you use vancomycin for that? No, right? Because Pseudomonas is what kind of bacteria? The gram-negative, right? So you would not use it for that. Vancomycin is only for gram-positives. Um, really no anaerobic coverage. There is one notable exception I'll mention here in a second. No good gram-negative coverage. It's really only for gram-positives. The big thing we like it for is because it does cover MRSA. And remember, what are two bugs that I mentioned that you want to keep a ear out for if I mentioned it covers it? MRSA and Pseudomonas, right? What were some drugs we already talked about that cover Pseudomonas? We haven't gotten to Cipro yet. We'll talk about that later. Which cephalosporins do it? So ceftazidime out of the third generation, which we, again, we don't use too frequently because of resistance. The other big one, though, was the fourth generation agent, which was? Cefepime, right? Cefepime covers it. What about out of the penicillins? The anti pseudomonal, yes, they're absolutely right. Anti pseudomonal penicillins, which one falls in that category? Starts with, so it's pseudomonas starts with a P, right? This one also starts with a P. Pipericillin, there you go, right? So you can start to make some of these associations there, right? Even though pseudomonas has a silent P, you can at least have that association between, you know, pepercillin and pseudomonas. Um, does anyone know why you can't hear a, a pterodactyl pee? No, because it's been dead for millions of years. Jeez. <laughs> um, other good things about vancomycin is it's really handy if you have a patient who maybe is penicillin allergic that you still wanted to get some gram-positive coverage for. So uh, one thing you'll see pretty frequently is if you had a patient going for surgery, remember what kind of bugs do we want to cover for with surgery? Not so much necessarily. Maybe if you're doing like a gut infection or something, you worry about things like that. But for a patient undergoing typical general surgery, you worry about skin flora, right? That's the big thing you're, you're concerned about getting into that wound and potentially causing infection. Remember what we used for um, uh, surgical prophylaxis we talked about? Uh, yeah, you could use a second, usually first generation cephalosporins is going to be useful there. So ANCEF or cefazolin. Um, some people call it cefazolin, doesn't really matter. 
That's the most common one. Well, if you had a patient who couldn't receive that, this is an alternative. You could use vancomycin as an alternative for that surgical prophylaxis. It'll get the majority of that skin flora. So that's another handy place it's going to be used for. Um, and, and when I say empiric antibiotics, this is something you're going to include if you are worried about a patient having MRSA, right? So maybe um, they have a skin infection that you think MRSA may be present in. Maybe they have a healthcare associated disease that you may think MRSA may be present. This is a drug you're going to use. And then when the cultures come back and they show that MRSA is not there, then you scale this down, right? So this is a drug that gets used very frequently for empiric coverage. And then when the cultures come back, you can scale back from it as long as, you know, unless it comes back MRSA, then you can use this for that, okay? The other big thing you're gonna find it gets used for is gonna be for C. diff. Now, Clostridium difficile, we said is what type of bacteria? It's an anaerobe, right? So we just said there's no anaerobic coverage, but this is one instance here where vancomycin is actually able to be used uh, for an anaerobic infection, right? So if you had a patient who is having uh, C. difficile colitis, right? You could use oral vancomycin. Now, you can't use IV vancomycin. It has to be given orally. The nice thing about oral vancomycin is, remember how big and bulky it was? Do you think it gets absorbed very well through the GI tract? It doesn't. Right? That's kind of the benefit of it. You actually don't get any absorption from it, so there's no risk for side effects, which we'll talk about in a few moments here. Um, so that's one of the big benefits. The other drug we'll talk about that covers C. diff is, anyone know? Uh, flagell or metronidazole. We'll talk about that later. Um, because we're seeing increasing resistance to metronidazole, because we're having over prescription of antibiotics, causing more C. diff infection, getting more resistant to metronidazole. In adults, vancomycin is now the first line drug for C. diff. So that's a good uh, notable change that's happened in the past few years or so. Um, I know metronidazole can be used for rosacea. Do you get, still get that uh, resistance from topical use? Uh, not quite so much. So uh, the nice thing with topical use is that you're only getting local actions with that. You don't have to worry about systemic um, resistance issues at, at that point. So um, you kind of get around that. And plus, when you apply things topically, typically the concentrations are so high that even if it was resistant, you can typically overcome that, right? So again, the topical concentrations you can achieve with a drug, if you try to achieve that systemically by giving an IV, you would probably kill the patient, right? If you're giving so much of it that it wouldn't, you couldn't do that, right? Um, but yeah, so good question though. You would not have to think about that. Um, other big things, anywhere you're worried about gram-positive infections, endocarditis, osteomyelitis, these are big places where we're going to see vancomycin get used pretty, pretty commonly there, okay? So again, gram-positive is always good to know what the coverage is for these bacteria, for these antibiotics. Now, you don't have to worry so much about which specific troughs we're looking for and things like that. Um, but when you look at the different bacteria, you can find that based on the MIC of the bacteria, we may need to shoot for different levels for that drug. Okay. So for instance, if the staph aureus has MIC less than one milligram per liter, then I know that, okay, well, I don't have to shoot for as high a levels as I would say if it came back greater than two milligrams per liter. So sometimes on those cultures and sensitivities you get back, it'll say, hey, it's staph aureus, but it has an MIC of say two. At a certain point, the MIC can get so high that it's very difficult to give vancomycin at high enough doses to even cover that bacteria at that point. Um, and again, what we're gonna find is, is that uh, vancomycin is a time-dependent killer. Now, do you think it's bactericidal or bacteriostatic? bactericidal, right? Because again, it opens up that cell wall, so it's going to kill off the bacteria very well. Now, if I was doing therapeutic drug monitoring, so you remember what therapeutic drug monitoring is? What is that? You monitor drugs therapeutically, correct. How do we do that? I put a little camera on them, watch them overnight, and I got like a live stream of it. it would, yeah, we, we measure blood levels, right? So if you were thinking about a drug that is bactericidal, but it's also time dependent. Do you think I'd want to look for a peak level or a trough level? Trough. Why trough level? Because it's time dependent. Because it's time dependent. So what, what, what's the connection there between the two? You want the lowest concentration to be above the MIC, 100%, right? So again, if you imagine drawing this, uh, what that levels are actually looking like. <laughs> so you're imagining time versus the, the concentration, if the MIC was, say, right here, when you're dosing vancomycin, and remember that it takes how long to get to a steady state? Four to five half-lives. That's usually around three to four doses of vancomycin. So remember, you're giving your doses IV. Oral is only going to be for C. diff, right? So you're giving IV. The goal is you want to make sure that when you're getting to steady state, that you want these levels to be above the MIC of the bacteria, right? Because when you're in steady state, it should be the same vacillation between peak and trough, correct? Because mm -hmm. assuming the clearance and the bioavailability hasn't changed for the patient, those levels should be retaining or should be pretty constant. So as long as this trough is above the MIC, 
I should retain activity there. And that's what we're looking for. So if you ever are getting vancomycin levels, it'll always be a trough level to make sure that you're staying above that MIC there. Now getting the specific levels, you don't have to memorize, but you'll see these come up pretty commonly. And depending on the indication, I may be shooting for a trough of say 10 to 15 or 15 to 20. Now what type of infections do you might think I'll be shooting for higher levels? Okay, so here's resistance. So if you have a more resistant bug, yeah, you may need to shoot for higher levels. Absolutely. What other things? What about the site of infection? Because I mentioned it's hard to, for it to get into certain tissues. What tissues do you think would be difficult to get into? The bone. Yeah, maybe the bone, right? So if you have an osteomyelitis, you may need to shoot for higher levels. Absolutely. What else? Hmm? The lungs, 100%, right? The lungs are very difficult for vancomycin to penetrate. If you have a pneumonia, you're worried about being MRSA, you got to shoot for that 15 to 20, right? What other big site is really difficult to penetrate? The brain, absolutely. That blood-brain barrier likes to keep stuff out of it, right? It likes to prevent drugs from getting into it. We saw that certain drugs have an easy time crossing, like the cephalosporins. However, vancomycin has a harder time, so you got to shoot for higher levels, right? The blood is a surrogate for what we think that concentration is out of the tissues. Even though it's not a direct measure, because it's hard to get direct brain levels of a drug, you can at least get the blood level and assume what that connection is going to be there. Now, sometimes with meningitis, you're going to find that when things get inflamed, what kind of happens to the, the gaps between the cells? They get tighter or they get more opened up? They tend to be more opened up, right? So that's why you end up seeing that some drugs actually have an easier time crossing when that inflammation is present. And that helps vancomycin get in there when, when uh, the patient's more inflamed, those meninges are more inflamed. Uh, the blood-brain barrier it tends to be a little bit more open there. So, but no vancomycin, if you start to see those MIC starting to creep up, which we are seeing as time goes on, MRSA, if it gets resistant to vancomycin, what does it turn into? Now it's VRSA. Now it's like upgraded to like the next level, right? So it's kind of like uh, like your bubble sore turns into like a, a IV sore, right? It's kind of like upgraded to another level. Hopefully, some of you guys get that reference. Maybe. Anyhow, um, so by upgrading, it, it turns into VRSA, and now it's even more resistant. I'm really hoping like in the next Pokemon game, they'll put more like bacteria-based ones in there. It'd be pretty cool, right? Like wild MRSA appeared. <laughs> anyway. All right. Um, so anyway, so this is why we need alternative therapy. So we have things like other drugs we'll talk about called like linazolid that are going to be our backups. And these are drugs that you typically want to hold on to because if you do see something that is resistant to vancomycin, that's usually a pretty bad sign and that you're going to need to hold off on those bigger guns until you have a really good need to use it there. So vancomycin, trough levels are what we're shooting for. And again, the higher levels are usually going to be reserved for more resistance or more difficult to penetrate tissues like the lungs and the brain. And again, four to five half-lives or so. Now, think about it. If we were to say you were uh, receiving a patient from the ER, you were working on the hospital service, and you were admitting this patient, when do you think you'd want to get a trough level? Which, which dose would you want to get a trough level before? After the first dose? After the second dose? After the second? Yeah, so, so what happens very frequently is we'll have someone who gets started on vancomycin in the ER, the hospitals will then admit them, and then we'll say, okay, we'll just go ahead and get a trough the next dose. And it may not be long enough for it to actually get the steady state. So usually we wait till after, uh, usually before the third or the fourth dose. Before the fourth dose is typically where you get kind of your most accurate levels at that point. What happens if you get it too soon? It's too high or too low? It's too low, right? So if you're looking at here, if I were to get a trough before the second dose, that's going to be much lower than it would be if I was actually at steady state. So when you see those levels, you're going to say it comes back at like, you know, say six, and you're shooting for a level of 10 to 15, you're going to say oh, it was too low. So what do you do at that point? Bump up your dose, right? Or you, you increase uh, the frequency, right? Maybe instead of giving every 12, you give it every eight hours. And now all of a sudden, you get that next level when they're at steady state. And what is it? It's too high, right? Now you're getting toxicity potentially, and we'll talk about what those uh, toxicities are for vancomycin. It is pretty, pretty particular. So anyway, so, and again, looking at the, the dosing recommendations, you need to know what the patient's renal function is beforehand. We've already talked about several drugs that need renal elimination or, or renal adjustment based off the patient's uh, creatinine clearance, right? And again, how do you measure creatinine clearance? Hmm? Yeah, remember that cockroft galt equation? You need the patient's, usually the age of the patient, you need the weight of the patient, and usually their serum creatinine, right? By incorporating that in, Right, and again, there's different formulations, but they usually require the same information for the most part. Um, you tend to find that uh, you have to adjust your dose, and most often you're adjusting the interval in order to make sure that you're not going to overload the patient there. Right, 
Because again, by changing the enteral, I'm just giving the body more time in order to clear that drug there, right? The dose actually doesn't change because I still need to get those levels up as high as I need to. But by changing the interval, I'll give the body more time for it to clear out. So that way, by the time I give that next dose, the trough, it should be where it's supposed to be. So if you notice here, say the creatinine clearance is greater than 70, I can give the drug every eight hours. That kind of makes sense based off the fact that it's a time-dependent killer. Just like with penicillins and cephalosporins, you know, usually, you know, with penicillins, like every six hours or so, or maybe every eight hours. But what do you notice about the renal function as it goes down? You give it less frequently, right? Because your body needs more time for it to clear out through those kidneys. You have a patient who's just in the 30 to 49 range, already giving it Q24 instead of Q8. Um, and then below that, you have to actually just give single doses at a time. That's what we call pulse dose, where basically we'll give a one-time dose, and then we'll get random levels afterwards. And whenever the patient gets into the range we're looking for, then we'll redose them. Because um, what would happen if I had a patient like this, and I just kept them on a schedule, and I wasn't checking the levels? Yeah, you can see a lot of accumulation and then you can have toxicity there. So, um, again, be very cognizant. And also, do patients' renal function change over time? Yeah, so in some patients over the very long time, they can change, but also in the very short term, an ICU can change from day to day. Uh, if you give like a loading dose, do you still check after four like, half lives? It's a good question. What do you think? What's the point of a loading dose? <laughs> yeah, to get them to stay, stay right away. Yeah. So for some patients, especially if they're critically ill, you may start off with a loading dose, um, you know, depending on how frequently you're giving it. Because if it's every 24 hours, I might have to wait like three days before I actually get that level back. Um, so you could do it sooner in those cases there. But very good point. If you give a loading dose, presumably you're at steady state. You may check the uh, level early, maybe before the second dose. I, I would consider doing it. Mm -hmm. So for all these drugs, you'll need to check your renal function. Or what if they're like... That's a good question. So what do you think? So in the ER, most of the times you're giving like a one-time dose of stuff. So in this case here, can I just give a one-time dose without knowing what the renal function is? Why? Exactly. So if the patient, uh, again, the, the renal function doesn't affect the dose I'm giving, it only affects how frequently I'm giving it, right? You may adjust the dose based off of this, but in this case here, you're always going to be given the same dose. Usually you're starting with 15 to, milli 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram. And then you will then adjust the frequency based off of the renal function. That's the nice thing in the ER. A lot of times you can start off with a single dose of something and it doesn't really matter, right? You can have time to get those labs back and you make better determinations at that point. Also, if you're in the ER, you don't really care. You give a single dose of vancomycin and you say, send them upstairs, you don't have to worry about it anymore, right? <laughs> That's kind of life of the ER. And you get people like Professor Kaplan, who's the hospital <laughs> on the hospital service, and he says, okay, vancomycin, pharmacy to dose, and then it comes to me, and then I got to sit there and figure it out, right? <laughs> so that's ultimately the, the nice thing if you work in a hospital setting, that most of the time for these uh, drugs like vancomycin, the glycosides, very frequently the pharmacy is going to have a protocol set up to where we can actually um, dose the medications and do the levels independently. So if you're fortunate enough to have your pharmacy personnel help you with this, uh, they can basically do, do it all for you. They'll put a note in the chart saying, here, here's what we're doing. We're just in the dose like this, blah, 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 um, you know, but you may be working somewhere where that's not present, right? You may be working in the middle of nowhere, trying to pay off those loans with that loan forgiveness program. And then pharmacy is like, you know, they're only there for eight hours a day. And then, you know, they're, they're once they're done, they're done. Um, so these are things to consider, right? So at least we want you to start thinking about these sort of things. Anywho, so as far as monitoring goes, the big thing you're worried about with vancomycin is the issue of the renal clearance. If it's too low and they're not clearing the drug, then there are risks for ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. I say ototoxicity, what does that mean? Yeah, you can have hearing damage. It may or may not be reversible. A lot of times you can actually damage the hair cells and the cochlea, which is going to cause long-term hearing damage for the patient. Imagine if you have a really sick patient in the ICU who's intubated and they're sedated for weeks at a time, are you going to be able to know if they have ototoxicity? Not really, right? So the best thing we can do is monitor those levels to make sure they're not accumulating too much drug there in those cases. Um, nephrotoxicity is the other big one. We worry about this, especially with patients with poor renal function, maybe due to um, hypotension. If they're on uh, vasopressors like norepinephrine or something like that, if they're on other antibiotics that hurt the kidneys, this can be synergistic with one another. So you really got to monitor renal function. Quite frequently on these patients, who are, on this, uh, who are the sickest of the sick, or usually in the intensive care unit, you may be getting daily serum creatinines on them to monitor this, right? You're also, what else can I use to, to detect how well the kidneys are working? 
your output is very handy, right? So if I have someone who's intubated, sedated, I probably have a Foley in them anyway, and I can actually monitor very easily what their urine output is. Um, if you have someone who's maybe on the floor, maybe they're not uh, using peeing into a urinal, that may be more difficult to ascertain, uh, especially if they're not being you know, compliant with that. So little things to think about, right? The other big thing to note about uh, vancomycin is what we call the red man syndrome. And this is related to the infusion rate of the drug. So if you infuse vancomycin too quickly, the patient's going to feel very hot. They're going to get very flushed. They may develop hives. What does that look like? It looks like an allergic reaction, right? So this is one of those things where people say, oh, I have an, an allergy to vancomycin, where very frequently it was just this red man reaction they end up getting here. So what do you do about that? Well, if it's because you're infusing the drug too quickly, what can I do? Slow it down, right? So this is one of those things where our default is to infuse the medication over two hours, right? Most drugs you can push in, you know, cephalosporins, I can push in over five, 10 minutes, give it over 30 minutes, no problem. This drug at the bare minimum should do 90 minutes, two hours. Because we know if you go too fast, you're going to get these infusion reactions here. Okay, fevers, chills, phlebitis can develop. Um, and again, it looks like an allergic reaction, but really it's just related to that rate of infusion, okay? And we talked about the dosing. Again, this is a time dependent, so you do typically want to have more frequent dosing, but this is all dependent on renal function. Actually, in children, you tend to find that we actually dose this uh, Q6 hours very frequently, right? We'll actually do Q6 hour dosing. Um, it's more difficult to do that in adult patients. What do you think Q6 hour dosing is more, is more difficult in adult patients? It's more work for the nurses, right? If you got, you know, 15 patients you got on the floor and you have to get Q6 hour dosing, they're going to scream at you. Like, it's not going to work, right? However, in pediatrics, usually the nurse to patient ratio is a little better. They have more time to, to actually do that and devote to those patients there. So that is one benefit. But however, imagine if you're like a preterm neonate that comes in. What do we say about their renal function if you think back to... So you're not very good. Sometimes for vancomycin, for them, we're giving it every 24, every uh, 36, every 48 hours potentially, right? So again, it's very, very dependent on the renal function, okay? Anyway, as I mentioned, we'll typically get a trough done around the third or fourth dose or so. Again, trough should be about 15 to 30 minutes before the next dose. Or is anybody going to show us where to find these trough levels? How do you mean? Oh, like what kind of monitoring uh, therapeutic ranges you're shooting for, right? Is that what you're talking about? Like, like what's a good trough level for a drug, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that... Yeah, so that's available. So um, so if you look on something at like Lexicomp, right, so if you go through up to date and you type in vancomycin, there's usually something like called a therapeutic range section you're looking for or monitoring, and that'll tell you what kind of uh, monitoring you need to do. So if it says, hey, you need to get this 30 minutes before the next dose to get a trough level, then it'll, it'll mention that, right? Or it'll say like when to get a peak level for say certain other antibiotics, okay? Uh, a good example for this is uh, certain anticoagulants like Lovenox, anyone heard of Lovenox before? Yeah, so it's an anticoagulant. We'll sometimes monitor a level called an anti-10A level. That has to be done four to six hours after a dose is given. It's very specific about when you get that. And that's often is going to be in these drug references here. Mm -hmm. But again, a trough level can be anything right before the next dose. It's just usually done 15 to 30 minutes beforehand. Another question? Nothing. Okay. Um, right, so again, now you know how to do the monitoring for that one. What would happen if you say, for instance, um, the nurse was... Um, you know, getting a trough level and it came back and it said it was 45. What did you think about that? So the level came back, you got a vancomycin level, the nurse said she, it was a trough level and it came back at 45. And the, the trough you're shooting for is 10 to 15. Good. I got to ask, what time did you take the level? Also, what else? Where'd you get it from, right? So did you draw it from the line that was infusing the vancomycin? What time was the dose given? Make sure the level was actually drawn before the dose was given. Very frequently, if you get a level that looks like that, it looks very wacky, you go back to the nurse and say, hey, what happened here? And they'll say, oh, I totally screwed up. I got the level after I gave the dose, and that's actually a peak level, right? Those are things you want to look at. If the level looks funny, you need to kind of do some more investigation because your, your gut reaction may be to do what? Stop the drug and I'll say, okay, well, I'm going to just do random levels and I'll wait until it gets down to the right trough and then I'll go from there, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, are you always taking 
yeah, we're, we'll talk about an example of that coming up pretty soon here. Um, but that is generally the case, right? And again, these are very few antibiotics we're actually doing this for. It's just that vancomycin in, in the, on the inpatient side is such like a, a ubiquitous drug. So many patients are going to, you're going to put patients on this drug. Um, this is why I kind of uh, talk about it so much because it is so easy to screw up. And at least I want you to be, be cognizant of it. Okay, I, I know vancomycin, I'm looking for a trough level, right? I know because that's a time dependent antibiotic, I want that trough above the MIC. I want these things to kind of start to make sense to you. Okay, um, and as I mentioned, random levels are sometimes done if they have unstable renal function. Again, I'll just give like a one-time dose, and then I'll check it, say, 24 hours later. If they're still, you know, sitting at, you know, 28, then I'll check it again another 24 hours, and eventually when they get down to the trough I'm looking for, then I'll redose them at that point, right? So sometimes you'll see that uh, being done occasionally, okay? But remember, you have to really be specifying the time from when the last dose was given to when that level is actually done. Sometimes, you know, get a level that comes back a little high. Say, for instance, I'm shooting for, say, 10 to 15, and it comes back at 17 and a half. And I look at the times, and I'm like, okay, well, actually, they drew it two hours early. Sometimes they try to put levels along with other labs they're doing at the same time. And so by interpreting that, I would be like, okay, well, I know it's early. It's pretty close. I'm going to go ahead and leave it the same, right? A lot of times doing nothing is going to be the best thing for, for your patients in, in these cases here. Anyway, here's an example of red band syndrome, what that looks like when you're infusing the vancomycin too quickly. Again, if a nurse calls you and says, oh man, this guy's getting really flushed after I administer the vancomycin, ask how fast were you giving it? How long did it infuse over, right? Um, you know, sometimes you need to infuse it. We have some patients that have to get it over a four hour period just to prevent uh, this reaction from occurring there. And so a lot of times it was actually due to impurities in the drug. So this used to be much more uh, common. It still happens with the drug we have nowadays. Um, but vancomycin actually has to, it used to have this uh, nickname. It's called Mississippi Mud. And if you look here, here's some of the, the first product that we had uh, of vancomycin that we were administering. So you imagine that being reconstituted. It looks like mud being infused into you. Do you feel pretty good about that? No, definitely not, right? So nowadays we have a lot more clear nice, non, uh, very pure sort of drug here. We don't have to worry about this quite as much, but again, it's, it's related to that rate. Will the rash go away, like, immediately after It'll take a little bit of time, probably 15, 20 minutes, you know, or so it should start to dissipate at that point. Some people will try to treat it with, like, Benadryl or something like that, but, you know, you can just let it kind of go away on its own. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's vancomycin. So those are all of the cell wall active drugs we've kind of talked about so far. So we have the, the penicillins, we have the carbapenems, we have the cephalosporins, monobactams, we have vancomycin. Those are the main cell wall active antibiotics that we have, okay? Now moving on, we're going to get into the protein synthesis <laughs> inhibitors. Okay, so what are these going to do? Basically, when you have uh, the ribosomes, right, what do ribosomes do for us? They build our proteins, right? So you have your DNA. It's going to then translate or transcribe? Transcription. You have transcription, right? It's going to produce RNA. The RNA goes what at that point? It's translated into <laughs> proteins, right? So this is where we're going to try to interrupt this process here, right? And so for the most part, we kind of mentioned this before, when you inhibit protein synthesis, does that immediately kill the bacteria or is it kind of just prevent it from growing? generally prevents it from growing. You're fine, there's some notable exceptions to that, which we'll mention, but for the most part, this is a bacteriostatic sort of process here, okay? Because we're inhibiting protein synthesis. And so, again, the reason why this is so specific for bacteria and not necessarily for us is because we actually have uh, different ribosomes. So, for instance, here you have a 50S and a 30S for the bacteria. For us, as mammals, we have 60S and 40S. Different enough to where you're gonna find um, that it should not have a lot of interactions with our protein synthesis, which is a good thing, right? We want it to be selective for the bacteria. However, you may find that high levels can have some negative effects on our cells, so there are still some, some uh, side effects here. Now, you may be able to, to break down and say, okay, well, which ones actually affect the 50S? Which ones affect the 30S? Actually, I don't care if you know that or not. I just want you to know, do they inhibit protein synthesis in these cells? Okay. That is the extent that I want you to know this stuff. Okay. So I want you to know that if I'm trying to mix and match two different drugs together, remember we said, do we want to use two drugs that have the same mechanism or maybe different mechanisms? <laughs> well, things with different mechanisms, right? So again, if I put two drugs on there, I said, which one of these uh, offer complementary mechanisms? You can pick one that was cell wall active and was a protein synthesis inhibitor, right? If I needed two drugs to cover pseudomonas, I could use a penicillin, and I could use maybe potentially one of these drugs here to cover that, right? So again, we'll talk about which ones can specifically do that, but remember the mechanisms, right? It's an important thing to consider. So we'll get into all these, but basically by inhibiting these ribosomes here, you can make further protein production that's gonna inhibit the cell from further replicating and, and produ uh, reproducing itself, and thus then your own host immune system can come in and start to, to get rid of the rest of it, okay?
So start off with the macrolides. This is a very common drug class that you're going to run into, right? So this is where things like your azithromycin, everyone's heard of a Z-Pack before. A lot of people probably taking a Z-Pack at some point in their life. There's clarithromycin and then erythromycin. Okay. Now, unfortunately, with like the penicillins, it's pretty easy to tell if something was a penicillin because how's the, what was the naming convention there? Into with a cillin, right? With the the cephalosporins, how could you tell? Started with the ceph, right? For the uh, monobactam, oh, not monobactams, the uh, carbapenems, ended with like meropenem, imapenem, right? Ended with the penem, so you can tell it was a carbapenem. This is going to get a little more kind of wishy-washy in terms of the names here, right? So just because something ends with a mycin does not mean that it's a macrolide, right? You can find things like gentamycin and tobramycin. They're actually in a totally different class here. So these are things you're going to spend a little more mental real estate trying to make sure you kind of categorize them appropriately because they do act a little differently. So anyway, so erythromycin, clothromycin, and azithromycin, ACE. It's a good mnemonic to remember your macrolides. Um, very wide ranging in terms of their, their activities. Uh, very good activity against a lot of different bacteria here. Um, for instance, like erythromycin, you can see it used intravenously, topically. Uh, you can use it orally. There's a lot of different varieties that are out there. Usually with the erythromycin, you find different, uh, a lot of different salts. And so you want to make sure you kind of keep it that in mind because the dosing may change if you're dealing with the stearate salt versus the ethyl succinate, et cetera. Make sure you know which one you're actually dealing with in the case comes up. Um, clothromycin, azithromycin, again, very, very common drugs we use, uh, um, especially for outpatient use for a lot of different infections. So the macrolides have really good gram negative, good gram positive coverage. They also will cover what we call our atypical bugs. Okay, so if you have someone who you think has an atypical pneumonia, with an atypical bug, things like mycoplasma, things like Legionella, a macrolide is a really good agent for that. Okay, so that's why when you say, for instance, you see like a pneumonia in a patient, say who's very young, say like a six-year-old, you may be more focusing on things, or say like an upper respiratory infection, like you're more focusing on things like you know your moxicillins and whatnot. When you get to older patients who maybe are more likely to have some of the, and I say older, I mean like adult patients who may be more likely to have an atypical bug, this is where your macrolides get a little bit more play for those patients there. But some other things this will cover. Get your strep pneumo, right? It's a common upper respiratory bug. You're covering this in ENT, correct? Yep, you should be. Um, MSSA, you know, listeria. It will not cover in, uh, enterococci, so you don't see this used for a lot of gut infections, but a lot of respiratory infections can be managed with a, a macrolide here. Also, we'll cover a lot of gram negative aerobes here, right? So, H flu and M. cataralis, right? Strep pneumo, M. cataralis, H flu, those are your three major. Uh, uh, upper respiratory tract bugs, right? Um, you're going to find that maybe the coverage is going to be a little different between them in terms of how good they are hitting those. Azithromycin tends to have the best coverage against Moraxala versus the other two. Um, you also see this can work for gonorrhea. This is kind of the, the limit as far as the gram-negative coverage goes. So, But again, the big selling point is going to be this atypical coverage here. So if you have a patient with an outpatient pneumonia, this is a good drug for that, right? Because it's going to cover the atypicals, it's going to get your upper respiratory bugs, it's going to get all of that, okay? Um, again, not clinically used for anaerobes, so again, gut infections, this would not be a good uh, class of drugs for those. So what do we use it for? Uh, skin and, and uh, skin structure infections, we use it for respiratory tract infections. Um, we also can use this for things like mycobacterium avium complex. Anyone ever heard of this before? What, is it, uh, uh, what kind of patients do you see this in? 100%, yeah, yeah. So patients like HIV, this is more progressive. Um, this is actually an AIDS-defining illness. Um, if you have patients who are immunocompromised, say from chemotherapy or something, uh, MAC is something you may need to prophylax against. So if you see a patient who's on, say, azithromycin with no stop date on it, it could be related to prophylaxis against that, right? Um, chlamydia can cover that. H. pylori, what do you see H. pylori at? Actually in the stomach, right? So one of the, it's a bacterial cause for a lot of stomach ulcers, right? And we know the number one drug-induced cause for stomach ulcers? Okay. Aspirin, but more broadly, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, naproxen, things like that. This is a bacterial cause for, for peptic ulcers. Um, is anyone familiar with the story of the doctor who discovered this? Got a Nobel Prize for it. It's actually really interesting. No one believed him that it could be bacteria causing these peptic ulcers. So what did he do? He drank the bacteria, gave himself an ulcer, and then took antibiotics, and it went away. Um, <laughs> he's an Australian doctor, but go look at some videos. It's really neat. Um, but anyway, so this is a part of the component for that, that drug regimen. We'll actually give them uh, something like clarithromycin, and it will help to cover that. So I said it doesn't cover a lot of gut infections. That's one notable exception is H. pylori. It will cover that.
We'll talk more about that later in the GI section. Um, big things you're going to find here with the macrolides is they do cause a significant amount of GI distress, and it's actually because they interact with the motilin receptor. Have you guys heard of the motilin receptor before? Well, just based off the name of it, what do you think it does when it's activated? Has increased motility, right? So how might that manifest? Well, cramps, abdominal pain, diarrhea, very common to see that. Well, do you think we could use that for any benefits? Yeah, maybe if patients are constipated, if they have gastroparesis, we use this very, very frequently. Frequently, We actually use erythromycin. Um, a lot of our GI kids will put on erythromycin because it stimulates those motilin receptors. If they have um, any kind of like, you know, gut dysmotility issues, um, we use it all the time for them. So very, very good from that standpoint. Um, so if you ever see someone who's on erythromycin chronically, it could be related to GI issues, as you'll see. But it could be a source of adverse effects for, for your other patients. Um, again, allergic reactions are possible. You may see some close stack hepatitis. It's pretty rare. Um, and then potentially uh, hearing loss. This is more, more related with large IV doses and patients who can't clear the drug very well. Um, this is, again, a very rare thing. Most of the time, we try to stick with oral macrolides if ever possible, right? And then another thing to note here, QT prolongation. This is the first drug we've seen now that can cause QT prolongation. Why do we care about this? Because if it prolongs long enough, what does it result in? Torsades? De pointies, right? I'm just kidding. Torsades de point. I, I'm not really French. I can't say for sure. But you can just call it torsades, right? What is torsades? It's a ventricular arrhythmia. It's very interesting looking. Why, why do they call it torsades de points? Twisting of the points, right? So what does it look like? If you look on the EKG, you'll see it kind of goes like this, and it gets big, and then it kind of flips over, and it gets small, and then it gets big again. Very distinctive if you see it. Again, it's a very poor interpretation of it, but if you look up an EKG with it, you'll kind of see what I'm getting at. Anywho, does that look compatible with life? Negative. <laughs> Not good, right? Anyone know the treatment for it? IV? Beta blocker? Beta blocker? No. Magnesium is actually the treatment for that. You give them a large doses of IV mag sulfate, and that's the treatment of choice for that. Something will come up in ACLS later on, give you a little head start on that. So magnesium is the treatment of choice for torsades. It's a very good board style question, right? So anywho, so this is something we're concerned with, right? So this is a problem if patients are also, now again, if you give a million patients azithromycin, are any of them gonna to develop torsades? Very unlikely. The problem though is when you start to combine multiple medications, it can lead to QTC prolongation, right? So if I had someone who's on an antiarrhythmic already that prolongs it, they're at bigger risk when I add something else onto it that prolongs it, right? If they have electrolyte abnormalities like hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, these are things that can increase that risk. That's the question, why do we see QT prolongation? Now, it looks like with uh, Professor Kaplan, you're covering some of the cardiac conduction cycle, right? All right, we're gonna cover that again when we get to cardio a little bit later on. Well, what happens, what causes ventricular repolarization? that last phase of the cardiac cycle. Potassium efflux, right? Potassium efflux, all the positives leaving that cardiac cell, get it back to that resting membrane potential, right? What happens if I were to block that up with a drug? I, I prolong the repolarization, that prolongs that QTC interval, right? QT interval gets prolonged, that's why you end up seeing this here, right? And so what you end up seeing is that this would be a normal this would be the normal here, but it gets prolonged when you have that delayed repolarization. That allows for those kind of reentrant arrhythmias to come in there, right? So again, uh, not every patient that has QT prolongation will develop this, but they're at bigger risk for it. Yes, sir. What's the difference It's a good question. Anyone know? It's a corrected QT, yeah. So based on the heart rate, you can find that the QT interval will change, right? So faster heart rates, obviously, it would be smaller because it's beating faster. Um, for uh, slower heart rates, it tends to increase. So there are different calculations that are out there that will allow you to get a corrected QT that it, it takes the heart rate out of it, essentially. So I could have someone with a heart rate of 100 versus someone with a heart rate of 50, and I can get a apples to apples sort of comparison between the QTC intervals there. So that's what that's done for. Very frequently, you'll find on your EKG strips, it'll just report out, it'll automatically calculate it and give you the QTC, okay? Now you could measure it out with calipers and actually do it yourself. Um, some people, that's ultimately more accurate in a lot of cases, but usually the machine readouts is good enough. Anyone know what a uh, normal QTC is? It's usually around 440 milliseconds, or for females, it tends to be 450 milliseconds. 
as normal. These patients, once they are at risk for torsades, they start to get about like 500 milliseconds, sometimes 600 milliseconds. You get very, very prolonged here. Again, azithromycin is probably not going to do this to them on their own, but what if you had a patient at an undiagnosed prolonged QT interval? It's a cardiac abnormality they had since birth and they never knew about it. This could ex uh, exacerbate that. They had other medications that could exacerbate this. This is where it becomes a problem, okay? And then if they go into torsades, what are you going to give them? Magnesium. Two grams IV magnesium sulfate, absolutely. And again, here's a, could just wait for the picture to show up, but that's what it looks like essentially on the EKG. I only run into one case of that. It's actually a lady who uh, had overdosed on the um, antidiarrheal drug called loperamide. Um, she'd actually taken it along with a SIP inhibitor that allowed it to uh, get into the brain more readily. Uh, very interesting drug interaction she induced in herself, but it ended up going into torsades. So I uh, recommend do not take too much loperamide. I think she took like two dozen boxes or something of it. So. People do weird stuff. I'm talking about that. <laughs> Anywho, other big thing. Speaking of SIP interactions, this is a huge thing to also remember. This is probably going to be more clinically relevant than the QTC interval prolongation. The only reason why I harp on the QTC thing so much is because we're going to run into a lot of other drugs that do that, and you need to keep that in the back of your mind, right? Because if I have someone who's on maybe a psych medication that prolongs QT, they have a cardiac rhythm dis, uh, dysrhythmia that they're on a QT prolonging drug for, and they add a macrolide on, this is where it becomes a problem. I had one patient who was in the ICU um, who was a, uh, she had leukemia, and she ended up having a bone marrow transplant. And when you have a bone marrow transplant, you have to be put on immunosuppressants to prevent the body from reacting to the new cells that are being put in, right? Um, so she was on a lot of immunosuppressants to prolong QT. Also, by giving an immunosuppressant, what do you think it does to their risk for infection? It goes up. So we had them on antifungals, she was on antibiotics, she was on antivirals. All these different things were leading up, and her QT was probably sitting up in the 580s. Uh, and again, I said normally 450s uh, is considered a normal. Uh, just that baseline, that was that. And a lot of it was due to that drug influence there. So you got to be really careful with this stuff when you're adding multiple things on board. If you give a patient immunosuppressant, would you be less likely to notice if they're interacting or have an allergy to another drug? Um, I don't know if you're necessarily less likely to have uh, the appearance of allergic reactions necessarily. I don't think you really interfere with that pathway so much. You're more often, though, are not going to notice that they actually have infection occurring. You know, maybe only like a fever is maybe the only thing you'll notice, right? But you may not have a lot of other manifestations of infection there. It's usually the more prominent thing you run into. Okay. But good question, though. I'm not sure. Um, so anyway, in terms of SIP interactions, be really careful with the macrolides because they will inhibit SIP3A4, right? Remember, is SIP3A4 a big deal? Uh huh. Remember, I said if there's one SIP enzyme you remember out of pharmacodynamics, SIP 3A4 was the big one to remember because it's involved in over half the drug metabolism interactions with the SIP enzyme system. So you got to be really careful for that. So if something is a substrate for a SIP 3A4, what happens to the levels of it when I start someone on azithromycin? It's going to go up or down. The SIP inhibitor, the so levels of the drug are going to go up, right? because I'm inhibiting further metabolism of that drug, so the drug levels are gonna go up here. So if I had a patient who was on, say for instance, a, an immunosuppressant like cyclosporin, and I added, say, erythromycin on board, and I inhibit that SIP enzyme, and now my cyclosporin levels go up, now I get too much immunosuppressant effects, now I'm increasing my risk for viral, bacterial, and fungal infections in a patient, right? These are some of the manifestations, these interactions that you can run into, okay? So be very careful with that stuff. So always, always, always check your medication profile before you start prescribing these medications here, right? Go through, make sure it's up to date, make sure you know things have been discontinued, new drugs, look for over-the-counter drugs, herbals, et cetera. You gotta be aware of this stuff, okay? Okay, let's do a 10-minute break. We'll come back and we'll move on into the tetracyclines. All right, is everyone ready? Continue on. All right, any questions from the first half? I didn't get very many slides in. I apologize. I'm like, man, I can talk about this stuff all day, apparently. Um, do you guys want to go till like 4.30? No. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I saw two hands in the back. They can stay. You guys can stay. Go on. Uh, I have one question on the board so far. Uh, if a patient isn't clearing a drug that's already uh, that's cleared renally, can you assume it's still doing the job actively in the body? Yes. So if I have a patient who's not clearing the vancomycin, right, and their levels are too high, uh, I can assume it's still killing off that bacteria, right? So it's still doing its thing, which is good. However, it's doing its thing too well, and it's also going to be hurting some of our cells additionally, right? So you can still see that, that renal and the ototoxicity you get with that. So the drug still works. It just is around too much, right? Uh, and still causing other issues. Um, okay. Okay. 
I had some other questions that came up uh, before I, I meant to address uh, before class, but so questions about studying for farm, right? Some of the best ways to do that. Um, again, I mentioned the flashcard thing. Flashcards are good for some people. Uh, flashcards are not so much for other people. It just depends. Uh, there are pre-made ones out there that you can purchase. I will say that um, if you do that, make sure to try to edit them to kind of cover what we do. You may find that if you bought flashcards designed for pharmacy students, it's going to have way too much detail, way too much stuff that you don't really need to know uh, to to be a good PA, right? I'm trying to pare this stuff down to exactly what you need to know to take care of your patients appropriately, right? So edit, take this stuff out. If I say something that's not on the card, put it back on, right? Or put it, put it, uh, add it on there. That's one thing. Um, who's heard of Sketchy Farm before? Yeah, so Sketchy Farm is something you can check out. Basically, it's people who, um, they will do drawings, and they'll go through a whole topic. So if they're talking about anticholinergic drugs, uh, the one I watched, I think, was about anticholinergics, and they did this whole, like, scene where somebody was, like, walking down the street and the car hit them or something like that. It's very visual-based, so if you're a very visual learner, it can be very handy to help you memorize certain features of these drugs on the test. Uh, I thought it was completely useless, uh, but that's me. I'm not a very visual learner, so... <laughs> I only mention this because it may not be for you. So try to check this stuff out. At least get a sample of it because these things do cost money, right? And resources are finite. Um, and again, your time is also finite. So if it's not going to work for you from a learning standpoint, then it's, it's useless, right? Um, other things that have really worked for some students is something called mind mapping. Anyone heard of mind mapping before? Yeah, so it, it's a way of kind of visually representing the connections that you're making in your own mind in terms of connecting different disparate facts to one another. So as an example, uh, if you were trying to memorize certain details about drugs, right? Um, say, for instance, I was and again, the, the handwriting is not going to be great here, but you kind of start off with these bubbles of facts here, or, or bubbles of categories here. So for instance, if I wanted to say, okay, well, what are the drugs that work on the cell wall, right? So I'd say CW here, and then you can then branch off of here. So then, you know, what, what's a category of drugs that work on the cell wall? Yeah. Penicillins, right? So I could put my penicillins here, and then maybe what's another class? Cephalosporins, right? So I'll put my cephalosporins here. And then from there, I can branch out and say, okay, well, you know, what are my different categories of pen penicillins? Well, there's the natural ones. What else? There's the, uh, the anti-staphylococcal, anti-pseudomonal. And so you're breaking them down into further categories, right? So that way, when you look at a test question and you see something like piperacillin, right? So I see PIP on a, on a test question. Because, again, very frequently, the, the questions are going to be such that the answers are four different drug names, right? I'm not going to put the drug categories on there. I'm not going to put beta-lactam, vancomycin, uh, tetracyclines, and, and macrolides. It'll be specific drugs. And so your job is to take a connection, go from piptazo and link that back. Okay, I know that's an uh, anti-pseudomonal penicillin. Okay, I know it's a penicillin, so I know it's a cell wall active drug. So I know it's going to be bactericidal. I know it's going to be a time-dependent killer. Trying to map out these connections in your mind has helped some people. Again, if you look at this and you're like, that sounds stupid, it might be for you. That's okay, right? So these are just different ways that people have succeeded in farm before. Does that make some sense? Okay. And again, reach out to me if you're like really having a hard time with the subject and you're spending two hours wasting your time on something. That's not a good use of your time. Just come and talk to me. Write me an email. I'm usually pretty good about getting back to people fairly quickly. Okay. Okay. Anywho, moving forward. Um, so we have next up our tetracyclines. What do you think you call them a tetracycline? There's four rings here, right? So again, what does it kind of look like to you? I thought it kind of looks like a little tiger or something, like a little animal. I'll become important in a second. Just you wait. See his little legs here? Or maybe a caterpillar. You can see that, yeah. Anyhow, you can see how the mind works in, in mysterious ways sometimes. Tetracyclines are going to work uh, very similar to the macrolides and our other protein synthesis inhibitors here. Again, don't worry about which ribosome it is specifically. Just know it's blocking the ribosomes from working, right? Usually by blocking the transfer RNA from actually uh, bringing in new amino acids to add onto that chain. You inhibit the chains that it cannot form new proteins at that point, uh, point here. Again, these are bacteriostatic. You're not going to kill off the bacteria specifically just by inhibiting protein synthesis, okay? These are also going to be a broad spectrum sort of drugs here. You'll see tetracyclines kind of used uh, for just about everything. Um, in some uh, cases, you're going to find it used a little bit more commonly than others. But you notice here, what do you notice about the, the coverage? Yeah. Green lights all the way. You can ride that out to the sunset, baby, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. 
it almost looks too good to be true, and in some cases it actually is, right? So you gotta be really careful uh, with these medications due to some of the, the, the drawbacks of them. But the main ones you're gonna run into include tetracycline, minocycline, uh, available PO, and doxycycline is probably the other uh, big one as well, right? So you see uh, that one's available IV, it's used occasionally that way, but most of the time it's gonna be PO, right? Anyone know what you call a, a dachshund on a, on a bike? Doxycycline. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, so again, you're going to see the coverage here, very good coverage against things like atypicals. You're going to have uh, very good coverage against a lot of animal-borne organisms, so things like Yersinia pestis. Anyone know what that causes? Plague. The plague, the bubonic plague, right? So um, Yersinia pestis, Brucella, Borrelia, um, that's all going to be covered by your, your uh, tetracycline. So very broad coverage there. Good for things like enterococcus. This will actually cover some MRSA. It's going to cover a lot of gram-negative, um, gram-negatives, anaerobes. I mean, like it gets a ton, a ton of stuff here, right? H. pylori. Um, not great coverage against pseudomonas and not going to be good to treat C. diff. However, all these other things, it's going to be really good for it. And in fact, if you were to ever have like a biochemical uh, attack with uh, some sort of uh, microorganism, most of the time, actually, tetracyclines are one of the drugs that they, the, the CDC actually stockpiles in case of an attack like that. It's one of the drugs that may administer in cases of one of those attacks. Anywho, so what are some things we're going to see tetracyclines being used for? Acne is actually a big one, right? You may see some ta uh, topical use of things like minocycline. Oral doxycycline can be used here. Because again, why would you use uh, antibiotics for acne? Because ultimately, it's a bacterial issue, right? You have all that sebum and all that kind of stuff clogging up your pores. Well, anaerobes like to grow in that, and so the uh, tetracyclines can help cover that. Good for uh, atypical pneumonia, as I mentioned, things like Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, a lot of animal-borne diseases can be treated by these. Um, you can treat chlamydia uh, with doxycycline. Um, however, so some things you want to note about these, and these are the drawbacks and why you may not see this used super frequently. Uh, one thing is going to be the, the drug interactions. This is a big one. If you were to consume, uh, say, doxycycline or, or tetracycline along with iron or calcium, those things tend to chelate. When I say chelate, what does that mean? They like to bind it up essentially, right? So when it gets bound up in the GI tract, what happens then? can't get absorbed and it just gets eliminated through the feces, right? So you basically will eliminate the utility of the drug there. So if I said, hey, a patient, um, you know, the infection isn't clearing, you know, they were taking um, doxycycline, they said they drank it with a glass of milk, you would know that it was a chelation reaction and they weren't absorbing the drug. That's why they're not getting better there, right? Other problems you're gonna run into, photosensitivity. When I say that, what does that mean? sensitive to light. Usually if they go out into the sun, sun exposed areas tend to be, uh, they can get rash and, and things like that. So again, it's important to make sure to tell them to cover up, make sure they are maybe using physical sun blocks and things like that to kind of help prevent any kind of photosensitivity there. The other big thing to know here as well is that uh, you can have this discoloration of teeth. Now teeth are mainly made up of what? Calcium, right? So it would make sense that doxycycline and other tetracyclines combine to calcium, right? So it actually does that in the bone and in the teeth as well. So this is why we want to be very careful about using these in certain patient populations. There's some concern, especially in the second and third trimester of pregnancy, that it can actually help to suppress bone growth. So you don't want to use that for those uh, pregnant patients there. And then also you may want to avoid it in uh, younger patients, typically less than eight years of age, because what do you think that is? Yeah, their adult teeth are still growing in. Um, that is one of those things that we say a lot, but it may not be as clinically relevant as we think. Certainly if you're on it for long term. So say if you're on it for say like greater than 21 days or something like that, that's where the teeth staining may be more of a concern. Once that happens, it's kind of a permanent sort of issue there. So again, be wary of the tetracyclines being able to bind to and causing uh, either skeletal growth uh, inhibition. Don't use it in pregnant women and be very careful using it in kids less than eight, okay? Lead them to the uh, teeth discoloration. Uh, again, these have to be renally dose adjusted, so at least be aware of that. The nice thing about the macrolides, it didn't have to do any dose adjustments for those. Those are mostly hepatically eliminated, um, so that's one benefit of the macrolides. You don't have to think about a lot of uh, dose adjustments. Okay, um, similar to the uh, tetracyclines are, is going to be the glycocycline class, and there's only one drug in this category, and it's called tigacycline. What do you think when you hear tigacycline? Like tigers, right? And again, it has like a little tail on here. So this is actually all the marketing for the drug actually was really pushing uh, the tiger thing. So I think I put a picture in here in a second. Um, but basically, this has very similar coverage to the tetracyclines. It's really good to cover a lot of different things. Problem though is that this is IV only, and it's being used for a lot of uh, very serious infections, usually nosocomial infections, especially things that are producing 
um, uh, say for instance like ESBLs and things like that, you, you can use it in these cases here. The one thing you want to be careful, if you have a really sick patient in the, in the ICU, um, be careful using a bacteriostatic agent because it may not have the, the good enough immune system to really get rid of those other bacteria. You may want to some, use something that's a little more bacteriocidal, but can be using it and very frequently will hit it. Um, use it for uh, complicated intra-abdominal infections because it covers all kinds of different anaerobes, cover gram-positive stuff, gram-negative, kind of covers everything from that standpoint. So it's uh, really good for that uh, for that purpose. And again, here's the picture here. So imagine if you were the doctor, got to walk through the, the halls of the tiger with you. Like, I wouldn't mess with that doctor. I would be like, sir, your vancomycin, oh, I'll just fix it, I'll fix it. All right. I'll mess with the tiger. Also, it's like bright orange. So that's kind of the other thing with it too. So if you ever see like an orange bag being hung on a patient, it's probably uh, tigacycline that's being used there. Um, anyway, other nice thing about these is that, uh, you know, they do uh, require no dose adjustments for the most part, at least for this one. Uh, you may have to worry about it if they have some significant hepatic impairment, but that's a nice benefit there. Not a lot of side effects other than that. Anyway. So those are the, the tetracyclines and the glycocycline. Uh, next, we have the aminoglycosides. This is another one we're going to spend a lot of time on, just like we did with vancomycin, mainly because this is another workhorse set of antibiotics here. We have three main ones in this category, including amikacin, gentamicin, and tobramycin. Now, either in ENT or opto, you may have heard about uh, neomycin previously. Has that, has that come up before? Right. That falls into the same category here, but neomycin is not something we typically use intravenously or systemically. That's more of a topical product, and we'll mention those when we get to those sections later on. Um, but these are the three that fall into this category here. So, um, anyway, so the aminoglycoside, their main thing they cover is gram negative bugs. So, just like you saw with vancomycin only covering gram positives, the aminoglycosides have very good activity against gram negatives, and that's kind of all it does, right? So it's very good at what it does, but it's very limited in scope, right? Um, so very specialized in that case there. It has really good coverage against pseudomonas, has really good coverage against all those escape bugs we kind of mentioned yesterday or the, the other day. Um, it'll get things um, uh, that are usually of nosocomial in nature. So if you're worried about a healthcare associated uh, disease, this will generally cover a lot of those gram negatives there. What's interesting is that actually, in some cases, you may use it for a gram positive uh, purpose here. So, for instance, enterococcus, you can actually use this for synergy. And when I say synergy, what do you think that means? You can use it with another antibiotic to get better kill for those bugs there. This is actually one you'll see when we talk about cardio, we'll talk about endocarditis briefly. And you'll see when you have those nice big vegetations of bacteria just sitting on the heart valve, um, it can be very difficult to penetrate. And so sometimes what we'll do is administer something like vancomycin to try to disrupt the cell wall. And then that will allow something like aminoglycosides to get in there and be able to inhibit further protein synthesis. And these are one of those exceptions where these are actually uh, going to be bactericidal. Okay, so one notable exception here is that the immune glycosides are bactericidal, okay? So anyway, um, so again, drug of choice for things like febrile neutropenia, sepsis, intercoccal synergy, like I mentioned with endocarditis. And then uh, the big dosing considerations here is that it has to be renally dose adjusted. This is another one you're going to have to do therapeutic drug monitoring on, okay? Because the, uh, the therapeutic index is going to be much narrower than something else uh, like, you know, a tetracycline or, or um, a macrolide. The other big thing to consider here as well is it causes renal and ototoxicity. So again, think about that in terms of vancomycin, aminoglycosides. Oftentimes they're used together, right? So if you have a patient who's coming in from the nursing home, and is the nursing home a healthcare arena? 100%, right? So when you have someone coming from the nursing home, you assume they have a healthcare associated disease coming in with an ammonia. We don't know what it is. We'll put them on vancomycin. We'll put them on aminoglycoside, and then we'll actually double cover for pseudomonas. And so we'll use something like cefepime or piperacillin tazobactam, right? So you a three-drug regimen we'll give them in order to make sure we kind of get everything. And then once the cultures come back, we'll pare it down to something more narrow, right? So anyway, um, you'll notice here, though, that the uh, aminoglycosides tradition, we used to use Q8-hour dosing. Nowadays, we actually use Q24-hour dosing. And the reason why we made that switch is because it realized it has a post-antibiotic effect. You remember, remember what that is? Yeah, even if the levels drop too low below the MIC of the bacteria, guess what? They still don't replicate, right? Because it's kind of that shock and awe sort of effect. And we realized because of that, that the amino glycosides have concentration dependent killing. So instead of giving every eight hours, three times a day, we'll go ahead and give them one really big dose all up front, really kind of shock those bacteria. And even as the level gets down close to zero, that's okay because the bacteria are not replicating. Thus, we can then give it at the next 24-hour interval. Okay, does that kind of make sense? So in this case here, what do you think I'd be uh, looking for in terms of drug levels? Do I look for peaks or troughs? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. So 
depending on the dosing strategy, you may be looking for one or the other. And I'm going to explain why that is in just a moment here. So for instance, if I was giving a small dose every eight hours, what do you think I'd want to look for? Peaks or troughs? I'm giving it, I'm giving every eight hours or so, so the levels kind of look like this when you're at steady state. What do I want to look for? A trough? Why do I want to have a trough? It doesn't matter if I'm above the MIC, right? Because I said it has post-antibiotic effect. I could look for peak levels, right? So you actually, in this case here, you'd want to look for peak levels to make sure you're getting high enough to get that post-antibiotic effect, okay? Now, actually, I want to measure both, right? I want to get a trough level two. What does this tell me? If they're getting rid of the drug, okay? I need to know they're getting rid of it. Otherwise, if they start to accumulate it, guess what happens? Odo and the nephrotoxicity. I don't want that. So in these cases here, actually what we would end up doing is getting both peaks and trough levels on these patients to make sure they're getting high enough levels to kill the bacteria, and then we get trough levels to make sure they're clearing it. Okay, That was the old way of doing it. We did Q8 hour dosing. Nowadays, when we do the Q24 hour dosing, we're basically giving much higher dose, almost triple the dose, we get a very high level up front, and then what are we checking for here? Do you think peaks or troughs? Why do you want to measure troughs? You're right, but why? And make sure they're getting rid of it, right? Because again, high troughs is what we realize is associated with having otonephrotoxicity. Now, in this case here, why do you say why not why not a peak level? Because you're blasting with such a huge dose that you know you're getting the right kind of level, right? You're giving such a big dose that you know there's no issues with getting it high enough to get that post-antibiotic effect, you're good to go. You don't have to worry about peak levels. We only measure troughs to make sure they're actually clearing it. So again, that's the difference between something like vancomycin, where I'm measuring troughs to make sure it's high enough to kill the bacteria. Here, I'm measuring the troughs to make sure it's actually getting cleared from the body to not cause toxicity. Make that make sense? So again, you can do kind of multiple things with these levels here. Even though they're both troughs, you're kind of looking for different things, potentially. Okay. Okay. As I, you know, I mentioned, just as an example here, you know, seven mg per kilo once daily versus maybe uh, for Q8 hour dosing, we're only using two or three milligrams per kilogram, right? So again, just showing you giving a really big dose up front, you're going to get those high levels. You don't have to worry about measuring those peaks uh, for those patients there. And then again, when you're monitoring, you look for troughs to make sure they're actually clearing it. Now, if you ever have a level that comes back and it says less than one or less than five or whatever, that means it's undetectable. That means the level's low enough. You don't have to worry about that. I think my mic is going out. Is that the case? Yeah. He went intermittently? Okay. I don't know where the what are the microphone with. I'm just going to talk really loud, and then if you hear me, you hear me, right? You still hear me if I talk loud? Okay, I see the two heads in the back bobbling up and down, so I assume yes. Okay, good. Anywho, um, so again, depending on your dosing strategy, you may need to check for that peak and trough. That's only with your when you're doing the Q8 hour dosing, um, and usually what we'll do is we'll get like a peak level 30 minutes after the infusion. And then we'll do troughs usually 15 or 30 minutes beforehand, right? And again, you always need to correlate the time the dose is giving versus when the level is taken, okay? Okay, up next, we have uh, linazolid or Zyvox. This one is the in the category of the oxazolidinidione. It's called Zyvox. It's fine. You know, you don't, again, some classes you're going to find, you, get, you call by their chemical structure. Sometimes you don't. This is one of the ones you just don't even bother with it. Just call it Zyvox. It's fine. Um, so linazolid. So this is a really good gram-positive only killer. Okay. This is also working through protein synthesis, uh, synthesis inhibition, but it also is a notable exception as it causes bactericidal effects. Okay. And again, you may ask me, why does this one inhibit protein synthesis? synthesis and cause bactericidal effects and say like the tetracyclines didn't I got no clue I haven't actually looked that far into it I just learned it and that's good enough for me right anyway the reason why we do this are for things that are resistant to our kind of go-to gram positive killer and that's what vancomycin right so if you fail vancomycin or it comes back and this is a resistant to vancomycin this is what I bump it up to right so this is kind of the next line in therapy for that um, so again for multi-drug resistant pneumococcus MRSA VRE that stands for what? Yeah, the first two. What's the last part? Enterococcus. Yeah, so you have vancomycin resistant enterococcus. That's what that's going to be used for. No gram negatives, no anaerobes, nothing like that. So again, we use this as a drug of choice. If patients cannot receive vancomycin, sometimes a renal function is so hit or miss that we don't even want to bother with using uh, pulse dose therapy. So we can just go ahead and use Zyvox in those cases. However, you're probably going to get an angry phone call from the pharmacist. Be like, don't worry, we can dose it. It'll be fine. Um, it uses it as a backup if they do have proven resistance to vancomycin. Now, what's interesting here are some of the side effects you can see with this drug. So one thing being thrombocytopenia. So obviously you want to monitor their CBC. Would you be monitoring the patient's CBC anyway if they're on Zyvox? Why? Yeah. 
you're looking at the white count, right? You're looking at that anyway. So again, look at the platelets while you're doing that. You look for any trends to see if it's going down. Um, this is another kind of interesting one, though, this SSRI interaction. Now, anyone know what SSRI stands for? Selective. Why are you guys laughing? That's so funny. Oh, inside Joe. Okay. I'm, I'm on the outside, though. That's cool. No, that's, that's cool. That's cool. Anywho, <laughs> select a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. I'm not laughing now, huh? Uh, anyway, um, so it's interesting. So, so serotonin itself is a catecholamine very similar to epinephrine, norepinephrine. It's kind of made from the same precursor. Tyramine is being that precursor. Um, and so there are ways to metabolize serotonin, right? We have different enzymes that can do that. One of which is called monoamine oxidase. You guys ever heard of that? MAO. Right, so that's actually uh, there's actually a class of uh, antidepressants back before SSRIs were a thing. We had monoamine oxidase inhibitors that would actually prevent the breakdown of serotonin, and that would increase the levels and hopefully improve your mood. Right. Um, anyway, so Zyvox actually has some MAO activity. It can actually inhibit monoamine oxidase, and so if you have that on top of something else that increases serotonin, you can r run your risk of developing toxicity. And when you have that toxicity due to serotonin, what do you call that? Serotonin syndrome, right? So you run the risk. If you have a patient, say, for instance, they came in from the nursing home, they could not receive vancomycin for whatever reason, you start them on Zyvox, but they're also on, say, Zola for depression. That could be a big problem, right? Because now those levels of the serotonin can rise too high and you can develop serotonin syndrome. I'm not going to belabor that point here. Uh, we'll talk about serotonin syndrome in the psych section later on. Just keep that in the back of your mind that the Zyvox inhibits monoamine oxidase. That can lead to serotonin syndrome. That can be pretty pretty severe uh, if not caught and treated effectively. Okay. Um, this also means you have to be careful if you have other medications that can increase levels of things like serotonin or norepinephrine and things like that. And we'll talk about uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and, and Professor Austin will talk about this quite extensively as well in, in behavioral health. But anything that contains tyramine is also going to be interacting uh, here as well. If your patient is in the ICU, they're probably not going to receive a lot of tyramine containing foods. Does anyone know what contains a lot of tyramine? I call it all the bougie foods. Uh, so things like red wines, aged cheeses, smoked meats, all those kind of things, all those like really good, like delicious foods you'd have at like a fancy dinner party. That's the stuff that has a lot of tyramine in it and could cause a significant reaction with a drug like Zyvox. Again, keep that in the back of your mind. We'll talk about that more when we get to psych a little bit later on. Has bougie gone out of the vernacular? Is that not no. used anymore? Yeah, it's, not. it's not? It's still, no. it's still in? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I just got to check to see how out of date my references are. I'm going to keep using that one. Okay, so still in? I'm going to keep using it. I'm just going to keep using it for now. Okay, so anyway, so again, we mentioned Zyvox is being used for those vancomycin resistant um, enterococcus. This one's also really nice because it doesn't undergo any sort of uh, renal elimination. So as I mentioned, if a patient is really too unstable renally to receive vanco, you could use something like Zybox instead as a good alternative, which is really nice from that standpoint. Unfortunately, it's so easy to dose. You just do 600 IV or PO every 12 hours that most of the time providers will say, well, I want to use the easy thing, right? And they go to that. This is one of those ones we like to hold back on because if you are if you lose activity of this drug, if you start to produce things that are resistant to, to Zybox, you don't have a lot of other good options, unfortunately, right? Um, another agent that is very specifically gram positive is the one called daptomycin, or Cubicin is a brand name. This one's actually really interesting. It actually will cause bacterial depolarization, and that basically will shock all of the DNA and the RNA within the bacteria, leading to protein synthesis inhibition, and thus it actually can kill off the bacteria. So it's really kind of cool, novel mechanism that's not like anything we've ever seen, uh, at least in this lecture here. Um, one thing that's uh, very notable about this one, it cannot be used for pneumonias. So why can't it be used for pneumonias? Actually, the surfactant in the lung deactivates daptomycin. So if you ever had a question that came up, you know, if I gave you a test question that said, you know, patients admitted to the ICU, they're growing uh, VRSA on their cultures, um, which of the following drugs could be used to treat that pneumonia? Daptomycin might be an answer choice on there, and you're going to say that's not right because daptomycin cannot be used for pneumonias. Okay? Make sense? All right. Um, other things you have to watch out for, you can see a lot of myalgias. You can actually see some muscle breakdown from daptomycin. So you do want to watch their CPK levels. So the creatine phosphokinase levels, you want to monitor for that to make sure they are not uh, building that up. What could that result in ultimately if you didn't uh, do anything with it? Yeah, rhabdomyolysis, right? How, does, how, how would you tell if a patient had rhabdomyolysis? Yeah. 
obviously they'd be complaining of myalgias, but I'm thinking of like the ICU patients, like sedated, laid up. If you weren't looking at the levels, you'd see things like tea colored urine, like that could be a really big sign there as well, the myoglobin kind of uh, uh, leading to the kidneys. So again, those are our backups for the really resistant gram positive. These are things like to hold off on and unless we absolutely need to use them. Okay, up next is another big class. So very similar to the uh, the tetracy not tetracyclines, the macrolides. Macrolides got a ton of overuse, right? It's very easy just to say, here, have a Z pack and go home. You can use it for bacterial sinusitis. You can use it for uh, you know otitis medias. You can use it for all kinds of things. It got overprescribed, and as such, we see more resistance to things like this azithromycin developing over time. Um, this is a very similar story for the fluoroquinolones. You're going to see some parallels between the two here. Um, there's a lot of uh, drugs that fall into this category. Um, you also run into these quite frequently for uh, opto and also for ENT. I'm sure you mentioned like ofloxacin and, and ciprodex and things like that already. Again, I'm more talking about from the systemic standpoint. We'll cover those again when we get to those specific sections. The main ones you're going to run into here are things like levofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, moxifloxacin. These are the main ones you're going to see most frequently from an IV or systemic sort of standpoint. So how do these uh, drugs work? These are actually inhibiting the bacterial DNA gyrase, otherwise known as topoisomerase 2. Does anyone know what this does? Yeah, it actually causes single strand breaks in the DNA so they can actually relax that superhelical structure. And why does the DNA need to do that? It just needs to relax, man. She needs to unwind a little bit. <laughs> well, if it wants to produce new proteins and new RNA, it needs to unwind so that we can uh, open up that, that uh, helix and, that, and actually read and translate or uh, transcribe that, that DNA there. So because of that, you need topoisomerase too in order to make those strain breaks to cause that relaxation to occur. But what would happen if I inhibited that process? Yeah, it wouldn't be able to relax itself. It couldn't produce that new RNA. Uh, it may not be able to reattach itself if it had already been broken open. Uh, and so because of that, it allows uh, the DNA basically to kind of have this critical catastrophe and it just uh, will trigger apoptosis eventually, right? There's actually certain chemotherapy drugs we use for oncology that can kind of do the same thing. Um, but basically by inhibiting that DNA gyrase, you're leading to strain breaks, you're leading to DNA damage and thus cell death eventually. So these, again, are going to be bactericidal. Okay. So some key points of these, you're going to find these get used quite frequently for things like community-acquired pneumonias, sinusitis, uh, and occasionally use it for more like hospital-acquired pneumonias and things like that. Now, again, they get overused, they get overprescribed, and that's why you end up seeing um, so much resistant develop to these. And again, I'm only really referring to oral or IV use, more systemic use of these drugs here. Now, you can use it for ENT purposes. Topically, like otic preparations, you can use it for ophthalmic preparations all day long, and you don't have to worry about resistance. Why, why is that? super high concentrations achieved there, right? So again, I can put something in the eye and get really high levels and it doesn't get absorbed systemically to any great amount, right? I can put something in the ear and get very high levels and it doesn't get absorbed. So that's okay. You can overcome that resistance quite easily when you have doses that high. Here though, when I'm talking about systemic utilization, um, resistance is a much bigger problem, right? Um, one thing to note here as well, these are good for covering a lot of gram negatives that pop up for UTIs. You cannot use moxifloxacin. Anyone know why? Jacob? Postulate a reason why. Venture, I guess. Have a hunch. Yeah, absolutely. It gets metabolized in the liver, thus it never actually makes it to the kidneys. So if it doesn't make it to the kidneys, it's never going to get to the, the urinary tract. So because of that, moxifloxacin is not good for UTIs. Cipro, levofloxacin, those are all fine. I could totally use those, but not good for moxifloxacin. You occasionally see levo, uh, fluoroquinolones being used for things like infectious diarrheas. Uh, some skin stuff, not too commonly. Osteomyelitis occasionally. That's going to be more so if you were to have, say, like a polymicrobial infection related to like a decubitus ulcer, right? If you were to have something kind of close to the rectum and you have it worried about gram negatives and stuff like that. Um, but big interactions to worry about. Uh, it will bind with stuff in the GI tract, namely iron, calcium, uh, multivitamins, anything like that. It can potentially bind to and prevent it from working. So you do want to be careful with that. What other class of drugs did that as well? Tetracyclines, right? Tetracyclines and fluoroquinolones are the big ones that bind up ions in the, in the GI tract, uh, calcium and iron specifically. This is another one called QTC interval prolongation, right? This would be a problem if you were to have a patient on, again, something like azithro and fluoroquinolones, that could be a problem, right? Clearly, we wouldn't see that too often, but again, you can see when you combine multiple drugs, that becomes an issue, okay? What's the treatment for torsades if it developed? Magnesium. Magnesium, fantastic, right? Um, it can cause CNS effects in the elderly, right? That means mental status changes, okay? So when you see mental status changes in the elderly, what do you normally think about? 
Yeah, it could be infection. What else could it be? Dementia. It could be, you ever like put an old person into uh, an unfamiliar environment? What happens there? They get super wigged out. Are you ever like sundowning before? <laughs> they, they get pretty wacky, right? Because again, they are in an unfamiliar environment. They get very out of sorts. They can, get be, they can be violent in some cases there. So again, anytime you see mental status changes, you have to look back at the drugs to see if any of those are causing a problem there. Because it's natural to assume, okay, well, grandma's dementia is just getting worse. Or it could be drug related, right? And you can do something about that. So be aware of that. Um, there's some warfarin interactions. Warfarin, we mentioned it does what? Increases INR, so it's a blood thinner, it's an anticoagulant, right? Um, this can have some interactions with that and increase your bleeding risk. You do want to be careful with that as well, okay? Um, other things we're going to see there as well, which I don't, uh, don't know why I didn't put on this slide. It might be on another slide. Uh, what's the other kind of characteristic thing you think about with fluoroquinolones in terms of adverse effects? Some, of the, uh, some students were asking me about it the other day. The Achilles tendon, right? So you can worry about tendonitis developing with use of fluoroquinolones. We actually don't like to use this in children because it is more likely to occur in that group. We'll still use it occasionally, but fluoroquinolones typically you avoid using in children. You worry about tendonitis and potentially rupture of the tendons, namely the Achilles tendon is the biggest one you're, you're worried about there, right? You can say it's the Achilles tendon of the fluoroquinolones, right? Just kidding. Um, Anyway, so there's a lot of overuse, a lot of resistance to these, which is why we like to hold off on using them if possible, because they're so easy. You could use it for pneumonias and, and sinusitis and UTIs. You could use it for all kinds of things, and that's where we saw the resistance. That was the big problem there, right? So you get a lot of collateral damage from that standpoint. And not only that, you have to worry about C. difficile, super infections. So again, be careful with over-prescribing these, okay? Okay, so there's a couple different generations of cephalos, uh, fluoroquinolones you're going to run into. Cipro being kind of an earlier one, uh, which is a second generation fluoroquinolone. Really good um, gram negative coverage, gram positive coverage. Not really great so much on, in terms of anaerobes, but it does cover atypicals, which is again why we liked it for some of those uh, pneumonias, say, in like teenagers to adults. They cover a lot of things like mycoplasma, pneumonia, Legionella, things like that, which is great. Um, here, this earlier generation, it doesn't really get reliable pseudomonas coverage. You can see that it becomes a little bit more reliable as you go up in generation in just a little bit here. These are renally eliminated, so you have to have to watch for that. And again, that's where you see a lot of that ultramental status for the elderly patients is when you're not watching renal function, you're accumulating the drug, and that's where they run into problems. Going up to a third generation fluoroquinolone, we have levofloxacin. Now, is levofloxacin, is that related to any other fluoroquinolone you might have mentioned? Maybe an ENT? We heard of ofloxacin? Yeah, remember we talked about enantiomers? Ofloxacin is a racemic mixture. Levofloxacin is just the left-handed version of that, right? So remember those, those relationships there. Um, ofloxacin, you really only see for like otic preparations or ophthalmic preparations. Levofloxacin, though, is going to be the systemic one we use there. The benefit here is, again, you get better gram-positive coverage and you get better pseudomonal coverage. So this would be something you could use for uh, a patient who you were treating for, say, healthcare-associated pneumonia. Cipro you could use potentially for maybe uh, an outpatient one, maybe a community-acquired pneumonia because you're less likely to see pseudomonas there. But we'll, we'll talk about that more when we get into uh, pulmonology later on. But again, um, very useful in those community-acquired pneumonias because it has atypical and strep pneumo coverage there. Okay? Uh, again, this one's also nice because it's only dosed one time daily. Right? So again, it's better from a compliance standpoint. That's why a lot of people overused it. And again, renal elimination you want to watch for. Okay, next you have moxifloxacin or avalox, very similar coverage to, to levofloxacin, but remember this one cannot be used for UTIs because it's metabolized in the liver, so it never really makes it to the uh, urinary tract and any appreciable amount uh, for it to be uh, eliminated. Okay, so as I mentioned, complex with cations, you have to worry about that with oral administration, you have to worry about photosensitivity with these as well. Um, one minor interaction here is where it inhibits CYP1A2. There's not a ton of drugs that go through that pathway, but it is at least notable. Um, so if you ever are putting a medication through an interaction checker, like if you have a patient's med, hist, list, uh, med list, and you put this on there, you can see if there's any significant interactions through 1A2. Okay. I mentioned QTC prolongation. I mentioned the tendonitis. Be careful using this in kids less than 18 because, again, they're more at risk for having the tendonitis. Uh, and then occasionally you see those peripheral neuropathies. That's more with uh, use if you don't monitor for renal function and you get the levels too high there. Okay, up next we have clindamycin. Let's see how much time we have. Just some time. Uh, clindamycin, uh, this is another one that has very specific coverage patterns here. So this one is good because it has really good gram positive coverage and also has good anaerobic coverage. Okay, nice thing here is it covers MRSA. So again, those, one of those buzz things, right? So, so far, what have we talked about that covers pseudomonas? So, starting from the beginning, we talked about which cephalosporin does it? <laughs> 
fourth generation, like cefepime was a big one. Ceftazidime technically does it, but again, resistance is a problem. What about penicillins? Fepacillin, tazobactam, right? What else does it now? Fluoroquinolones, right? Fluoroquinolones will hit it, especially like levofloxacin, moxifloxacin. What else? Aminoglycosides, right? Those are the big ones that we covered in pseudomonas we've talked about so far. How about MRSA? Hmm? Banco? Linazolid? Daptomycin? Clindamycin now, right? So again, this is another one that's covering the MRSA. Try to keep a running list of these things. This is how I want you to categorize these things based on their coverage, right? Um, so think about this uh, sort of issue here. So clindamycin is another going to be uh, one that inhibits uh, synthesis of proteins. Again, this is going to be more of a bacteriostatic sort of drug here. Um, and it has really good gram-positive aerobic coverage, and it has good uh, anaerobic coverage, but no gram-negative coverage whatsoever. Okay. So if I was going to use this maybe for something like a gut infection, I would need to use it with something else. And so you're going to find uh, that for the most part, um, this is kind of a handy rule of thumb here, if you're trying to cover anaerobes and it's above the diaphragm, clindamycin is usually a pretty good one to go with. We're going to find if it's below the diaphragm, you're worried about anaerobes, there's going to be another drug called metronidazole or flagyl is typically the one you want to go with. We'll cover that a little bit later. Okay. So anyway, handy rule of thumb there. Uh, uh, clindamycin. Uh, you're going to see it also has some specific use cases. So if you had someone who had something like a toxin-mediated disease, clindamycin actually can bind up those exotoxins. So if you had someone who had something like toxic shock syndrome, maybe you had like a, a young female who had a, a tampon that was left in for too long and developed uh, severe hypotension and shock, you can actually use clindamycin in addition to other antibiotics to bind up those toxins there. So it's another kind of unique use for it. Most of the time, though, you're going to see clindamycin being used for a lot of skin and soft tissue infections or like gram positives there anyway, osteomyelitis, uh, surgical prophylaxis for patients who have a pen allergy, penicillin allergy, right? Um, or potentially for intra-abdominal combination, but you need to add something else that covers what? Gram negative coverage, right? So you could not use this alone for an intra-abdominal infection. You get the anaerobes, but you need something to get the, the gram negatives there. However, I had someone who I was suspicious of having maybe like a, a anaerobic pneumonia, like an aspiration pneumonia, this might actually be a decent agent to cover that potentially. Okay. However, one of the big things you have to worry about with uh, clindamycin, this is the most common one to cause C. difficile. And that makes sense. Why? That's the anaerobic coverage, right? So it kills off a ton of the gut flora. It disrupts that very significantly. So you're going to see a lot of diarrhea associated with this, but then also C. diff is going to be a big concern. So again, any of these antibiotics can potentially cause C. diff, but this is going to be the number one that's going to be most commonly associated with that. And then how would I treat that patient if they had C. diff? Vanco, which route? Remember, oral vanco only, right? So for adults, it's actually the gold standard now. It used to be flagyl, now switching over to vancomycin, okay? Oral vancomycin. Again, that C. diff can progress into what they call that pseudomembranous colitis. That's kind of the complication you see with a C. diff infection you're trying to avoid, hopefully. Okay, next we have sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Uh, you might see this being called uh, Septra or, or Bactrim. Um, these is a combination drug. But the two together actually have a complementary mechanism here. So this is actually working on DNA synthesis here, right? So in this case here, your cells normally need things like folic acid and to eventually form things like your, your nucleotides, right? So your guanosines, adenines, all that good stuff. So this is actually going to come along and inhibit the conversion of these forms of folic acid. So you can see here that, for instance, uh, sulfamethoxazole. It's going to inhibit as, uh, dihydrofolic acid production here by in inhibiting this uh, this uh, synthetase. The main purpose here, I'm not so worried about you knowing all the enzyme names here. I just want you to know it inhibits folic acid utilization to produce new DNA for the cells. Okay. Now, again, we can actually do this in human cells. What do you think we use that for? Where's the case where we'd want to prevent our own human cells from replicating? Cancer is a big one, right? Also for like rheumatologic conditions, like autoimmune conditions. So if you ever heard of the drug methotrexate, it is something very similar to this. Um, but basically, we have two different drugs here that are inhibiting the formation of tetrahydrofolate. If you can't form that, you're not going to be able to perform, uh, form those new nucleotides. And thus, if you inhibit DNA synthesis, what happens? It's just a catastrophic series of errors. It cannot produce new DNA. And guess what? It triggers apoptosis, right? Some people say you don't pronounce the second P, just apoptosis. I'd say apoptosis sounds better to me. That's what it is. Anywho.
So um, this one is uh, got good spectrum of activity, covers gram negatives, gram positives. Notably, though, it does cover MRSA, right? So now this is another drug on the list of things that cover MRSA, so it's good to know. That means it's also good for things like skin and soft tissue infections. Also has good enough gram negative coverage that it covers, uh, it gets used very frequently for UTIs. So a lot of patients have been on, you know, Bactrim, double strength, one tablet, BID for UTI, right? It's a very common thing or uh, um, for skin and soft tissue infection. The other nice thing that it does cover as well are going to be some of these opportunistic infections, things like pneumocystis carinae, things like toxoplasma gondii. Um, very frequently, you'll see our patients who are on immunosuppressive therapy or they're on chemotherapy or if they have like HIV, AIDS, um, they'll actually be on Bactrim usually like on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule to prevent those opportunistic infections from coming in. So it's a very, another common one. You may see the patients being on chronically and it's because of that prophylaxis there. So if you ever see Monday, Wednesday, Friday Bactrim, that's what they're doing it for. And again, a lot of different uses here, PJP pneumonias, both treatment and prophylaxis. Um, UTIs, you can use it for uh, respiratory tract infections. I see this less commonly. Um, maybe if you had a, a strain of H flu or strep pneumo that's particularly susceptible to that, but use less commonly for that. And then occasionally for things like traveler's diarrhea, um, but again, very wide utilization. You can see a lot of Bactrim being used out there uh, in, in clinical practice. Adverse reactions, though, um, you will have to worry about things like Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Have I mentioned that before? What is that? It's your skin just is falling off, essentially, right? So, again, you want to let your patients know, look out for things like oral ulcers, right? They start to form where you get blisters on your skin when taking the medication there. These are things that are big warning signs. You want them to stop taking the med and go where? To the ER, right? They need to be immediate care there because with supportive care, they can be survivable. But if, it let, if you let it go for too long, that's where you're going to run into some big issues there. So this is a good one to note about that. Um, and then other things to worry about, some blood discretion. Now, why, why do you think you'd have things like agranulocytosis and, and thrombocytopenia developing from this drug here? Hmm? Yeah, so this has some cross-reactivity, right? It can affect our human cells as well. And so this is why you end up seeing things like thrombocytopenia because what kind of cells are rapidly dividing in people? A lot of your blood cells are rapidly dividing. So you can see some issues of things like immunosuppression because, again, essentially it's working kind of similar to something like methotrexate, which we'll talk about later on. Can you, uh, like, uh, supplement with yeah, so some people, if they're going to be on it long term, you may consider supplementing with folic acid. Uh, it's not a requirement, and certainly if you're only for a short course, like 7, 10 days, this is not a big issue, right? It's going to be fairly uh, short-lived from that uh, standpoint. Mm -hmm. But it's something just to be, to be aware of, right? Um, in terms of drug interactions, you do want to be careful. It can inhibit SIP enzymes, and you will see things like uh, phenytoin levels, rifampin, digoxin results can go up, so you do want to be careful with that one, okay? Um, also, there's another big one actually inhibits the enzyme CYP2C9, which is an enzyme that inhibits warfarin metabolism, or it actually metabolizes warfarin. So when warfarin levels go up in result of inhibiting CYP2C9, what do you think happens to the INR? Go up or down? I got more warfarin, so it's more blood thinning. INR is going to go up in those cases, there, right? This is really significant because what did I mention about gut bacteria and vitamin K? Yeah, you need the bacteria there to help recycle the vitamin K so you can absorb that and, and more easily. So not only can you have the bacteria getting uh, disrupting the gut flora leading to problems absorbing vitamin K, which warfarin inhibits, but now you also you have higher warfarin levels there. I remember I had one patient uh, who, uh, my first rotation ever, and again, sorry for story time, um, my uh, first rotation was in a community health center, and there's a pharmacy built into it. And basically, my job was to run the Coumadin clinic that was there. I'd do that, see a patient, come back, and like work in the retail pharmacy they had built into it. And so I had this nurse practitioner that walked up one day, um, and she said, hey, you know this patient you, you saw the other day? I was like, yeah, what about it? Um, it's, that patient had a, had a very hard time getting their INR up into range. I mean, keeping increasing their dose, increasing their dose, and for whatever reason, they're su super resistant to it. Could have been diet, could have been a lot of things. Could never get this guy into range, right? Um, so anyways, like, well, did you notice last time they were starting on Bactrim? And I said, uh, no. She said, yeah, the patient bled out and died. I go, oh. and she said, I'm just kidding. Actually, it's in range now, in reaction. And after I changed my pants, I said, please never do that again. <laughs> now, keep in mind, I was a student at the time, so I did have a preceptor who was signing off on everything that I did. But that's an important interaction. You can miss that stuff very easily. Because, again, we weren't the ones prescribing the Bactrim. But had I asked the question, hey, do you have any new medications that were started recently? You can catch that sort of thing there, right? So again, you gotta be really careful and always ask the questions there. It could lead to a very significant drug interaction in those cases, okay? Always be wary of that.
Anyway, so let me see if there's any questions on the board. I know I'm leaving on the edge of your seat. I've been talking about Flagell all day. I won't even talk about it. I'm going to leave after the hurricane. I know. It's terrible. Darn. Let me see if there's any questions here. Let's see. Uh, are there any interaction between antacids and tetracyclines? What do you think? Yeah. Yes. Why? Exactly. A lot of those are calcium-based, right? So calcium carbonate or Tums is a very common one. So you can certainly see interactions with that. So you want to be careful with that. Uh, can you use Bactrim for prophylaxis for traveler's diarrhea? Uh, not that I'm aware of. There may be some instances where you want to do that, but most of the time um, you want to avoid prophylactic antibiotics if you don't need it, right? So hopefully you um, you know, do good practices like boiling your water and things like that and hopefully prevent it, but not that I'm aware of. But you can prove me wrong if you, if you find something. Um, and then can tetracycline treat neurosyphilis? Um, I'm trying to think, can we use it to treat neurosyphilis? I believe we use some other agents, but honestly, I've not looked at it recently, so I would check up to date and you get some better information about that than I can provide at this moment. Maybe give them a book report back after later. If not, um, any other questions I can answer? If not, please stay safe, stay out of the rain, the lightning, all that kind of good stuff, and come back. We'll have 63 coming back afterwards. All right.